Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Get to Know Your Neighbor, an interview show where we feature the people of Long Hill Township and you get to know them a little bit better. For today's episode, we are featuring local award-winning artist, Trish Classy Chinakis. Thank you so much for joining me, Trish. Thank you so much for having me, Tiffany. I'm really excited to be here for this interview today. I'm excited to have you. It's so cool learning your history and learning your background and knowing that you live in town is so cool because you've done so many amazing things. So (laughs) so to start, I want to ask you about your art. Can you tell us what type of art you do and what sort of influences your art? Well, I am a uh, sculptor artist. I mainly work with ceramic material uh, and I do Raku firings of my art. I also integrate found objects into my art and digital media. So I'll use from fiber optic wire to dried flowers. And I've also, my latest show, I've integrated augmented reality and NFTs into my art as well, minting my art on the blockchain. But I, I just love working with my hands and creating that the ceramic pieces but at the same time I really want people to have an immersive experience and feel what I'm feeling with my art and my art is based on emotions human emotions and a lot of survivor stories that the healing power of art as well and I'm influenced it's so funny you asked me who I'm influenced by I was just at MoMA yesterday and I saw a Marcel Duchamp and he influences me uh, with my artwork because he works with chance his artworks if the glass broke it was part of the art piece and for me with raku sometimes you never know what's going to happen pieces explode pieces crack the way the fire hits it changes the color so he's my biggest influence and i was like so excited to see his big uh, glass window piece at MoMA yesterday. (laughs) That's great. I love Marcel Duchamp. Now, your art is unique because you do, like you said, hands-on with ceramics and raku, but you also do the digital space. So can you, for people who are kind of new, because NFTs are new, can you explain Mm -hmm. what exactly that type of art is, what crypto art is, what NFTs are, that kind of stuff? Okay. Well, an NFT is a non-transbungle token. Uh, or they call it a nifty. Basically, uh, artwork, digital art can be uploaded and minted on the blockchain where it's minted on the Ethereum line, which gives it a monetary value. So besides the art having value in itself, when it's tokenized on the blockchain, it will grow in value as well because it was minted with Ethereum or whatever. There are new coins being introduced into uh, minting artwork on the blockchain. So like just recently, um, Ethos Spa and Summit just commissioned me to do a painting and I minted that on the blockchain. The artwork for them has a digital chip in it. And if you go up to the artwork, you can tap it and you can find out about the artwork and me creating the artwork. So it becomes a collectible piece that's traceable. So when it's minted on the blockchain, it can be traced in every way because it has all the digital data tied to it as well. So it's really interesting. And then when I create, I create, um, I use Oculus Quest 2. I'm working in Tilt Brush, creating these beautiful portraits um, of women and and just some environmental worlds. And I'm integrating that into my artwork and uh, uploading those as NFTs. I actually created a piece that I did a live feed while creating my artwork on uh, Facebook. And for whoever went to see my show, they get a free NFT. And that's the artwork that I'm going to be giving away. So I'm actually doing an NFT giveaway. (laughs) That's great. That's so cool. Now, before we get into um, more of your current artwork, I want to go back into time. And I want to look at where you came from and and your influences as a child. So where did you grow up and uh, what were you like as a child? As a very young child, we grew up on uh, Long Island, New York. And my mother actually ran a gallery and she took me with her to the gallery because, you know, she didn't hire babysitters. You know, she just stuck me in a back room, canvas, oils, brushes, see you later. (laughs) And I was just like, I just wanted to paint. So I actually did my first painting when I was four, an oil painting, (laughs) which my dad still has, which is kind of cool. And I just always loved figurative art. When I would sit in these galleries, I would just look at all these paintings all day long. And it was just, it really influenced me. And I got to meet artists and um, I was immersed in the world immediately. (laughs) 
And um, from there, I moved to Arizona, where I went to Arizona State University. I got a um, full ride scholarship and I studied graphic design. Well, my senior year, I took ceramics and it was my senior year, my last semester. If I would have taken ceramics my freshman year, <laughs> I probably would have just done that. But instead I took graphic design because I knew what, at the time I was really into computers too. And I knew that that was the way of the future. So I, I kind of like went with the professional marketing advertising path in my journey, <laughs> but still did my art at the same time. That's cool. When you were learning art, you know, before you did your first oil painting and whatnot, did you have a natural ability of art? Were there other things that you were more interested in that you wanted to pursue and then art you were just sort of like working on the side or how big was art compared to any of the, your other interests? For me, art was everything. I, I just, that was really all I cared about. <laughs> I guess my art has emotions tied to it. Whenever something big happened in my life, I would have to draw or paint or do something creative with my hands to, to get those feelings out. So all of my artwork is just completely driven about my emotional state, but I can also draw at any point because I, I know the human form so well. I've studied anatomy, you know, and because I painted at such a young age, I, I was never intimidated by a white piece of paper or a white canvas. I know when you're drawing for the first time, it's daunting, like, where do I start? Where do, where's, what do I do with my first line? You know, so I'm not afraid of the mediums. I'm not afraid of the paper. I've experimented in so many different ways with paintings. I'll, I've even gone in with a Zecta blade and ripped up my paintings. <laughs> and then, well, that looks kind of cool now. <laughs> That's the beauty about art, right? Is that you can kind of, you might think you're done. It's very Marcel Duchamp. You might think you're done, but then yeah. you do something else to it. And then you're like, no, wait a second. I think now I'm done. Yeah, I, I love art. So I'm a, I'm a big fan. <laughs> when you were in Arizona, was there anything that influenced you differently from when you were growing up on Long Island that sort of came into your art? It was definitely um, the Navajo and Hopi uh, culture out there because they do a lot of ceramic art. They do this blackened finish with their ceramic pieces, which the t terracotta and black colors are really evident in a lot of my pieces. I don't do like the symbolism with the Hopi or Navajo art, but I loved the fact that they worked in ceramics. And then of course, when I took ceramics, I took um, Raku, and I instantly fell in love with that. So there's a lot of Raku artists in Arizona because of the weather and you can kind of like do it any time of the year. Whereas here, when it's winter months, I, I can't do anything. You know, like I'm basically just creating pieces during the winter to get ready for spring. Can you explain to those who don't know what Raku is? Sure, so uh, Raku was invented in 1520, I think. In a town near Tokyo in Japan. Back then, when people worked when, with ceramics, they would put it, them in like a, a stone house and stoke it with fire, and the fire would go on for hours and hours and hours. Well, somebody made a mistake one day. They made the fire too high, too fast, and then it went out fast. So instead of being lit for 12 days, it was lit for maybe a couple hours. But what was discovered was this beautiful blackness to the clay and just these beautiful effects that occurred from that. Well, the Western civilization back in the 60s here in the United States, we took that Raku technique in the US and added different glazes and other techniques. So it's been an evolving art form. Even though it was originated in like the 1500s, it became refined with the glazes and working with chemicals and cobalts and coppers and all these different elements of the earth. When you create these glazes and the fire hits it, it causes different reactions. So the fire literally, I'm painting with fire when I do Raku, the, the flame, you know, licks the, the glaze and you'll get spectrums from yellow to purple to blue, orange is, it's, it's incredible. You know, one glaze, I can get so many different colors. I love that. <laughs> so let's go back to your more practical techniques that you've learned with the graphic arts. Can you talk about your first job after college? What exactly you did? Um, well, while in college, I ended up working for NBC. 
as an intern and I was there for four years and, and I loved doing on-air graphics. And there I, I actually won an Emmy Award for my on-air graphics while I was at NBC. I always looked for positions that kept me in the technology area of the world because learning is doing and if you don't use it, you lose it, <laughs> right? <laughs> From there, I was always very involved in computer art and graphics. I loved entertainment. I loved working in television. And I, I just always knew that was the type, type of industry that I wanted to work in. At th that time, I was in the newsroom, which was really exciting. And I was also interning at the Phoenix, um, the uh, Arizona Republic uh, newspaper as well, doing illustrations for stories for the newspaper. So <laughs> I was pretty busy. <laughs> I'll say. And then you worked at some other really cool companies like Fox and Major League Baseball Advanced Media. What kind of drove you to those companies? And what did you do there? I was drawn back here to New York. I got uh, to get my master's degree um, in computer art at School of Visual Arts. And because I had SVA on my resume, I was hired by my first boss, uh, Deck Reese. He was the VP creative director at Fox. And I worked on all, you know, Fox Sports, Fox Entertainment. I got to meet Matt Groening, you know, working on with The Simpsons and King of the Hill and X-Files. And, <laughs> you know, I, I met Dweezil Zappa when I was working there. <laughs> it was kind of fun. And so I just, then I, I knew right away I loved working in entertainment. And then from working at Fox, then I kind of, I started my company, Classy Design, and I started doing other projects. I got to do uh, NASCAR websites and Giants First website I got to work on. <laughs> <laughs> at Saks Fifth Avenue. I got an award for a website I designed for Saks Fifth Avenue Spring Fashion Collection. And then from there I went uh, to MLB and I was part of their startup. And I was there for seven years and gosh, by the I, I got to work um, with Elton John, Queen Latifah, Tom Petty. I met the little blowfish of Hootie and the Blowfish. <laughs> oh, and I even got to sing back up for Cheap Trick. So I was in charge of the entertainment division for MLB, doing all the artist sites and um, working on a streaming video and streaming audio for all their albums and any concert tours. And we had an in-concert uh, studio. And that's where I got to see everyone uh, for these private concerts that we streamed, but I got to be there. <laughs> that's so fun. I really loved working for Major League Baseball. It was so exciting and it was a really hard decision to make, but I wanted to be closer to my family because I was commuting, you know, almost two hours in, two hours out, and all those hours away from my kids and they were growing up and they were small. So I, I decided to get back to New Jersey so I'd be closer to home in case someone got hurt or something like that. <laughs> I had started my agency uh, back in 2000, but it was kind of like small projects while I worked full time. But then when I decided to just go all in, I ended up having AMC Networks as my client, the Sundance Channel, IFC, the Grammys, and then Bear, I became their in-house agency of record for Bear from Sucos. So I had this huge client list, but I was working like 12 hours a day seven days a week. <laughs> I had employees in LA. I had somebody working for me in India and then I had people in New York. Like, so I, I had people working for me, but we, everything was remote. So I'd always been a remote agency. So I would go into the clients for meetings then go home, work, delegate. It was pretty intense. Um, but even though I was home, I wasn't home because all I was doing was working. So it was kind of, it was kind of crazy. <laughs> so what eventually uh, made you stop doing the agency life? Well, I um, I discovered I had breast cancer in 2015, and it was kind of like being faced with mortality. And that's when all those questions come to your head, like, what have I been doing with my life? What am I missing with my life? <laughs> and it just kind of, God was kind of forcing me to, to close it up um, and, and just really commit to my family and my art. And my art, is what healed me. Like the, from the day I discovered I had cancer, I did my first painting onto like the day before my surgery, I did a painting and I've been doing my art and writing poems through my whole journey of recovery. And I haven't stopped either, but I do know um, that that is what kept me going, kept my positive attitude. You know, my community is awesome. <laughs> Just so many people in my town are wonderful.
you came out stronger because of everything that you went through, which happiness and strength is is a good yeah, thing. Definitely. And, and to realize you have that many people who care about you while you're still alive. I mean, most people only, you know, you get all the people that come out when you die, but I had people coming out and helping me and doing a food train and helping me with my kids. I was just so lucky to have so much support. You talked about how you did your art. You went back to your art. What did that moment in your life do to your art to either change it or influence it? What sort of uh, happened to, to your art in this aftermath? Well, what's amazing is, you know, the paintings, since that was the kind of art I did when I was an infant, that was really the only thing I could do because I really could, I couldn't even move my arms after I had a bilateral mastectomy. So all I could do was draw, all I could do was paint and, and write poetry. I, I literally had given up though. Right before coming down with cancer, I was giving my artwork away. I boxed up all my sculptures. I was like, I never want to look at this stuff again. And I was just fed up because I was just like, who am I kidding? No one, nobody wants my art. And then I came down with cancer and did these paintings and Summit Medical Group asked me to be in a show and people came out. There were a lot of other artists in the show and it just really was uplifting and encouraging. And then my church asked me to do a show there and I had my artwork out and, and I had one of my older pieces in a box. And somebody said, oh my God, let me see that. Pull that out, that's beautiful. <laughs> I'm like, really? <laughs> so I, I was like, so encouraged by so many people that I, I just kept with it and kept doing it. And what's amazing is if you look at my net art now, it doesn't look like there's a time lapse. It's almost like I picked up where I left off and my stuff, I feel like it's better now than it was before, but you can still see it's all done by the same artist, which I think is really important for artists because just in general to see an artist through time, how their work changes is amazing. It can go into so many different paths. It's really hard to stay focused as an artist to keep true to your style and true to your art. But if you can manage to do that, it, it's it's quite a feat. Well, you've done amazing things because you've won multiple awards internationally and nationally. So I feel like, you know, don't sell yourself short there. <laughs> <laughs> With all of this art, you now have uh, a new show that's going on out in Summit. So can you talk about this show? What type of pieces are in it? Name of it, your influences. Well, my show in Summit's called Elements of Emotions. It's at the Visual Arts Center of New Jersey. I'll be in the Anne's Place Gallery from April 17th to June 13th. I'm really excited about the show because it's kind of, um, it, it shows a lot of my journey with my emotions of recovering from cancer, a lot of the stories I've experienced and felt, how I was able to convey everything in my artworks. In the show, I have uh, one particular piece called Oil Fixation, where I have digitally minted on the blockchain and it's an NFC, so you can tap that artwork and get the information from the chip that's on the wall. I also have an augmented reality piece that goes with the show. I have the pieces wrapped on spheres and objects and you can touch them and they spin and different things happen when you go into this virtual gallery that I created. <laughs> I'm doing the NFT giveaway at the show. So if you go to my show in person and scan the QR code there, it'll send me notification to issue an NFT to you. <laughs> And uh, my pieces, they take up the, the space that are very interactive. So you can walk in and move around. I have pieces hanging from the ceiling. The fiber optic wire piece that's in my oral fixation piece is really exciting to look at and see because the fiber optic wire is actually emitting out of the, the mouth of the, the sculpture's face. And it, it just deals with how obsessed we can become with things. And that's why I call it oral fixation because you know people smoke or drink or whatever, you know, so. <laughs> It's kind of a very interesting piece. And I have another piece in the show called Unconscious Bliss, uh, which is a piece that's non-gender specific. It's kind of a moment of awakening, uh, loving your body again. So it's a kind of a moment of ecstasy, but you, you, you can't tell if it's a man or a woman, but you can tell there's a lot of emotion and, and tension going on because I uh, burned horse hair into the body to look like protruding veins coming off the body as well. <laughs> and then I have my water series, which is kind of like the emotions that we go through, how you know you kind of have to watch the waves and let it pass. 
with emotion. So I have water, I have air with my cage series, which I created during the beginning of COVID with the six feet apart and the pieces are all six feet apart. And I also have my earth pieces, which is the bark. And then the fire element is I raccoon and I paint with fire. So <laughs> that's how all the elements come together with the emotions. Oh, wow. That's awesome. So I want to also, I want to talk to you about uh, other stuff that you're doing with your art. What future endeavors do you have with your art and also how are you using your art to give back well future endeavors um i'm still going to be teaching at saint peter's university i teach um, the undergrad students art classes animation augmented reality and things like that and I, I love teaching and then i teach private art classes here in my studio and i do workshops for long hill township putting together a calendar schedule for uh, the next series of classes that i'm going to offer i also um, teach workshops for uh, studio montclair where I work with uh, people with autism, teaching sculpture. And right now, one of my students is learning stop motion animation and he loves it. So it's really cute. We work together and I'm teaching the technical side and then the sculpting side. So it's a lot of fun. And then I'm always, you know, trying to give back. I, I donate my artwork all the time to auctions for breast cancer. And I'm just keep, keep on doing my art. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And now you have two children. How has your art influenced them, if anything at all? My younger son, it's influenced him the most because uh, he's going to be a art major at Montclair State and he's going to be studying uh, graphic arts. He loves doing graffiti art and he does do ceramics too, but it, it, graffiti art is his passion. When he was seven, I signed him up for a graffiti art class at Morris Museum and he like thanks me to this day for that one class. <laughs> But my other son appreciates art. He sings and he likes to do comic strips, but he's, he's you know, more of a engineer. But I guess that's where, you know, I had the left and right side brain because I program when I do my art and I do it visually too. So <laughs> they both have it. <laughs> definitely, definitely. And is there anything else that you want to tell the residents of Long Hill, whether it's about you or about your art? Well, I would love to have people sign up for my next workshop in Long Hill and you could do Raku with a view with Trish <laughs> and um, you know it, it'll be mentioned on the Parks and Rec website when we post the next um, Raku workshop. Awesome well thank you so much Trish that was the end of our main interview but now we're gonna go into the next part of the interview which is the lightning round. For the lightning round, the way that this works is I'm gonna ask you 10 get to know you questions and you're going to answer them as fast as you can. We're trying to get to know you on a different level this time. <laughs> so are you ready? Yes. Okay. What is your favorite movie? I really love the movie, uh, The Price of Everything and Forrest Gump is my other favorite movie. <laughs> love it, love it. If you could have coffee with anyone, dead or alive, who would it be? Um, I think it would be Frank Lloyd Wright to talk to him about his architecture or Marcel Duchamp. <laughs> I had two people. Bring it back. <laughs> What's your favorite vacation spot? The ocean. Any uh, ocean? I don't know. I, I really enjoy the Jersey Shore. <laughs> That's where I go every year. Love it. What song would you sing at karaoke night? Oh, Life is a Cabaret. <laughs> Liza Minnelli. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. <laughs> What's the most unusual thing you've ever eaten? I would say crickets. Ooh, high in protein. Yeah, <laughs> I did it to um, impress my niece. <laughs> Amazing, I never had a bug before. <laughs> Who would you want to play you if your life was a movie? Oh, a movie. Reese Witherspoon. Hmm. I think she actually be really good at playing you. I think that's a great, great call, especially on the spot. <laughs> What's your favorite book? Um, I really love 100 Things, and it's every designer needs to know about people. Awesome. What TV show are you currently watching slash binging? Oh, um, The City on HBO. I don't know that one. I'm probably saying it wrong. 
It's with Kevin Bacon. Kevin Bacon's <laughs> latest, the city, it's a, it's a crime story. And last question, who is your favorite sports team? The Yankees. <laughs> oh, hopefully when this interview airs, they'll be doing a little better. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, thank you so much, Trish. Really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me. And I'll put the information up about your show at the end of this interview. And thank you again so much. Thank you, Tiffany. It's been a pleasure. Trish's art show, Elements of Emotion, runs until June 13th at the Visual Arts Center of New Jersey in the Anne's Place Gallery. If you know someone who should be featured on Get to Know Your Neighbor, drop us an email at longhillmedia at longhillnj.gov. Put Get to Know Your Neighbor in the subject and tell us why this person should be featured on our show. Be sure to include your contact information as well as the contact info of the person you're suggesting.